Hi, Glennis. Hey, Aaron. What do you want to talk about today? How much I f- hate diets. <laughs> yeah, diets suck. <laughs> so what do you do instead of a diet? Intuitive eating. Health at every size. So how many times have you had to explain intuitive eating and health at every size to someone? Like 5,000 times. But and- that was just to my doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so how many times have you explained it to someone and then they said, but diets are the only thing I know? That's like every time. Can we pursue health without thinking about weight? Yes, we can pursue health without thinking about weight. That's pretty revolutionary what you just said. But what if you just don't like yourself at the size that you're at? I think we need to understand why instead of just saying I need to change. So, what's the deal with body positivity? Oh man, that's a long answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Aaron Flores. And I'm Glennis Oyston. And we are Dietitians, Dietitians Unplugged. Unplugged. <laughs> hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Dietitians Unplugged. Howdy, Glennis. Hello. I, well, said, I said it like that because of our guests that we're having on. Oh yeah, that's good. Well, don't <laughs> don't give it away yet, okay? What? Don't give it away yet. <laughs> Don't give it away. Okay. All right. Um, All right. But, you know, I'm not going to ask. I'm just not going to ask how you're doing. Okay? okay. Or like what's new. Because guess what? Fucking COVID. Like it's... it's <laughs> nothing it's, is new. Nothing is new. Death we by are, boredom. But you know what? We're still here. We still are doing our podcast. We're still here supporting each other. And that's that's a lot, I guess. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> right. I, I mean, this podcast is a thing of joy for me. Like yeah. to to be able to reach out to so many people and do this, you know, provide this this resource for people. This makes me very happy. And even for, you know, for clients, I'm like, oh, hey, I have a podcast on that issue. Would you like to listen to it? And they're like, no, <laughs> Glennis, I've heard enough of your voice already for the week. <laughs> I'm like, okay. <laughs> Sounds oh, good. I have a podcast on this issue. <laughs> Would you like to listen to it? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Some on. of them are like, I'm not a podcast listener. I'm like, I feel like I'm not either. <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm moving on. All right. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, well, I didn't write a book, so you can't read that. There, That's very true. Yet. No, I'm not doing that. <laughs> We we and we cover that at the end of this episode today. It's a it's a topic of today's show. Yes, well, it's one a of the topic. topics. One of the a topics. topic. Do you want yes. to introduce our? Um, well, you want to say who we're talking to? Um, yeah, today we have the pleasure of welcoming Caroline Duner to the show, and she wrote the book called The Fuck It Diet, and it's by far one of the best named books of of ever. Um, yeah. and, and it's an excellent, one of the resources I always give out to folks about, um, about diet culture and why, you know, how, why you want to get out of diet culture and the harm that comes from it. So it's a, it's a really, um, really great book. And we've been, we've been waiting to get her on and finally, finally it happened. Yeah. Um, I've had so many clients say in the past year, like, Oh, I came to this anti-diet stuff from, you know, from the the fuck it diet. And I was like, oh, I I have been following her for a long time. And that's exciting. So um, then we thought, well, let's ask her on. <laughs> See yeah. if she'll come on. And and we're always surprised when we get a yes. Yeah, pretty much always surprised. Because <laughs> we have imposter syndrome. Total. Who wants yeah. to come on this show? Yeah. Um, and I got to say, thank you to Caroline Duner because I've gotten some clients from, you know, people who have who have read this book and said, and in fact, one of my clients, you know, was healing from an eating disorder and was sort of kind of coming along, but really was struggling and then read this book and she was like, oh, I get it. I'm going to do this. And like, it really helped a lot. And um, nice. yeah, so I, this... This is just uh, this is just a fun episode that we had too cuz she's really fun to talk to. Uh, totally one of the best people. I I would agree 100%. Yeah. Let me just tell our listeners a little bit about Caroline. She is a humorist and author of The Fuck It Diet, a book that helps chronic dieters untangle themselves 
from a dysfunctional relationship with food. She used to be a chronic dieter, fully convinced she was a food addict until she realized that dieting and body hatred were actually the roots of the issue. She lives in Philadelphia with her dog, Molly, who makes an appearance during the episode and is working on her second book, which we talk a little bit about towards the end. So make sure you listen to the end. Um, I love listening to her talk because like, again, you know, her story resonates for me. Oh, yeah. So much. No, and 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 also I love that, like, you know, that, that I like I love that she's not a dietitian. Yeah. To be honest. Like, you know, I think like it brings her own experience into it. Um and and like, but like as a writer, like just does like really is able to speak to all the research. Um, so just a you know, really, really great like writer, but also like like you said, someone just you want to talk to. Yeah, and and I should <laughs> say that because we are going to say the word fuck way more than we usually do <laughs> because that's the name of the book, like this episode might not be safe for work to listen out, out loud. So yeah. I know people have kids at home too and I know people don't like it when I swear. Just me, not you, just me. <laughs> and, um, but you know, <laughs> but I'm not bitter. Um <laughs> But just so you know, just so you're forewarned, as though we, as I think the title of the episode will probably also include that word. Just so, but you know, anyway, there it is. And and I would also just add, um, in in the discussion, we talk a lot about there is one section where we spend some time talking about calories related to a study, and and I just want to put that as a trigger warning to some folks if hearing those numbers might be hard um, to just skip over that little part where we talk about the Minnesota starvation study. Right. That's a good, that's a good idea. The good thing is we're certainly not talking about it in terms of this is what you should be eating. No, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We're talking about it in terms of people should be eating way more than they are. So exactly. Yeah. But if hearing numbers is just ick for you, then yeah. Fast forward about a minute or two. Um, well, maybe five actually. So I think we talked about it for a long time. So yeah, just to be safe, right? Yeah. Yeah, Just to, yeah, totally. We're still talking about the Minnesota starvation study that, or experiment, then just keep forwarding. (laughs) There you go. So excited for everybody to hear this episode without further ado. Here is Caroline Dooner. Caroline Dooner, welcome to our podcast. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited that you just said hello the way you start your podcast. Like I was listening. Oh, that's how I. Yeah, I was listening the other day and you were like, I have got like a whole, you want to do an outtake reel of all the hellos. And I was like, that would be amazing to hear you say hello like a hundred times. I should, I should, I've just, just started saving at least one outtake to put at the end. But I really should save all the hellos because there would be about 15 where I say, hello, welcome to the... And then I just... And then I go like, fuck. I don't know if I'm allowed to curse. You're allowed to curse. Oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah. People only (laughs) criticize me for it, so don't worry. (laughs) True story. (laughs) Why? That's a true story. (laughs) Why? I don't know. We just get... We get like reviews that say, Glennis, stop swearing so much. And I'm like, I don't even swear that much on the show. That's not fair. It's because you sound so sweet and people are probably like, (gasps) I think that (sighs) that could be it. What can I trust anymore? (laughs) That's true. (laughs) If we can't trust Glennis, who can we trust? (laughs) We can't trust the purity of Glennis's mouth. Oh boy. Oh Uh, boy. (laughs) Yeah. So anyway. (laughs) Well, I'm happy to be here. Oh, we're so happy to have you here. <laughs> your book, I got to tell you, your book is like, I had so many clients are like, oh, I read the fuck it book and that was, that was it for me. Like I never wanted to die it again. I'm like, great. Awesome. Oh my God. Yeah. So of course we're going to curse today, right? Yeah, we have yes. to, we have to curse because your book is literally called the fuck it diet. I know. I have been interviewed on one or two podcasts where they're like, my grandmother listens to this, so I'm, I can't say the name of your website. I was like, <laughs> okay, I understand. I actually, I actually understand. Yeah, but do they really think their grandmother's never cursed either? Like, come on. That's a good point. I mean, that's a very good point, though. I really do think my grandmother's 
don't. Okay. But my grandmothers are now totally senile, so oh. I'm not worried. Well, it might be coming out soon. <laughs> you never know. That sometimes brings out that that stuff. That's true. Yeah. That's actually very true. Yeah. I've seen it happen I will. with the geriatric yeah. crowd. Yeah, it definitely could happen. So, and we forgive. And they lose we their forgive. And, and yeah. my grandmother might be listening, and I hope you really fucking enjoy this episode. <laughs> Aaron has the coolest grandma ever. That is oh, that so is probably jealous. true. Yeah. <sighs> well, and but your dream. your website's been around for ages because I because I followed I started following you like a long time ago before your book came out, and I was like, yes, that's a pretty awesome name for a diet, like the fuck it diet, and I was like, I'm on board. So, yes. So it's been eight years. I've had the website for eight years. I've been writing about this for eight years. I've been doing it for eight years. And in the beginning, I, I was 24 when I started it. So I'm 32 now. Hmm. My parents were, I mean, you know, speaking of grandparents that don't curse, my parents are kind of, uh, like uh, prudish and, conservative with curse words and I'm, I'm Irish Catholic. So it was very like stupid was a bad word. I wasn't allowed to call anyone stupid. Um, so I was anonymous. I just was Caroline on the site. I didn't want anyone in my life to know I want, I needed it to be, I mean, I was also healing from some pretty extreme things, actually more extreme than I even realized at the time. I didn't realize that what I was actually doing was a sort of eating disorder recovery. Mm -hmm. You know, I identified with having disordered eating, but the more I look at it, the more I'm like, yeah, I mean, it's a spectrum, but I was definitely on that spectrum between disordered eating and eating disorder. So I wanted the buffer. I wanted to be able to sort of do it on my own without friends and family who wouldn't understand really necessarily knowing what I was doing. I did tell my mom what I was doing. Um, but the curse word, I was like, I just don't want anyone to like, I don't want anyone to get in my head. You know what I mean? I just like, I know this is a good name. I know that people are going to resonate with it. When I said it, it was like, oh my God, I just need to like all of the rules, all of the diet rules and weight loss rules. And like they they were just still, you know, crowding my brain. I was like, I just need to be able to say fuck it to all of them. Like that is the diet that I need to go on. That is the only way that I'm going to heal. Yeah. So I knew that it resonated with people, but I, I still, I was like, I need to be anonymous. I was Caroline. And then when I had to be on podcasts early on, I gave myself a pseudonym of Caroline Hagen, as in Hagen dogs, because that was <laughs> a big part oh my of my God, life. That is awesome. <laughs> That's amazing. I want to be Glennis Ben and Jerry's. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Aaron Talenti. <laughs> Talenti. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. I think that would like actually fly under the radar. People will be like, yeah, that must be your name. Yeah. <laughs> I'm curious if there was like one single moment where you're like, I'm just going to say fuck it to all this. Or was it like a progression into giving up diets? It was pretty quick. Um, I was on the paleo diet. I was like my last ditch effort. And before then, for a couple of years, I was doing this pseudo intuitive eating that I thought was intuitive eating, but was actually just super micromanaged, like, am I really hungry anymore? Put, put your fork down, put your fork down. <laughs> like super obsessive, um, quote unquote, listening to your body with the purpose of trying to eat less and trying to be thin. But I thought that I was eating intuitively. Um, and then I read the book, French Women Don't Get Fat. And I was like, wow, I'm going to put that together with, with intuitive eating. And I'm going to just like, I'm going to figure it all out. But then, of course, somehow, I don't really know what led me to it, but it was something online, something I read online where I was like, oh, maybe what I really need is a paleo diet. Maybe that'll heal me from the inside out. And I was diagnosed PCOS when I was in high school. So I was so much of my dieting, at least a big chunk of it. It was obviously also, you know, cultural and I wanted to fit in with what I thought was beautiful and acceptable. And I was, I went to school for acting. So there was all that there with, with looks and thinness, but I also was so obsessed with health and heal quote unquote healing myself. And I really believed that I, Oh, darn it. Someone's here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Hold on. Um, I'm recording this podcast, so I'm just gonna, okay, come here. 
Sorry. <laughs> this is what I get for being at my parents' house trying to <laughs> not have to wear a mask every time I go We outside. can cut that out or leave it in. Really, uh, it could go either whatever, way. That's whatever gold. you want. That's whatever gold. Whatever you want. <laughs> um, I have no idea what I was saying, though. What was I saying? Oh, okay. Yeah. Health. Yeah. So I was really, really obsessed with healing myself. And I, I, you know, I had this belief, even when I would like think about gaining weight or hearing that people were choosing to gain weight or even reading intuitive eating, I, I'm pretty sure that I, when I read it when I was 18, I was like, wow, this is amazing. I really need this because I'd been dieting for years before that throughout my teens. But I pretty sure I still read whatever they said about weight diversity and body diversity. I was like, yeah, but I can't. I can't because I have PCOS and I can't eat, I can't really eat carbs too much and I really can't gain weight. So that was this like deep, deep, deep belief that affected every choice I made and everything I was, you know, doing with food and trying to do with weight loss. Um, so I was on the paleo diet and like every other diet, I was finding myself binging on like I would be per- you know, absolutely perfect and religious on the diet for a couple months. And then I was just starving, <laughs> honestly. And I, I was always thinking that the diet was going to quote unquote, heal my cravings. Like it would, it would heal me so much that I wouldn't crave food anymore. And I wouldn't crave bad food anymore. And I wouldn't crave quote unquote, too much food. Um, never worked by the way, because that's not how it works, but it sort of feels like it's working in the beginning because you're on this sort of high of this new diet that's apparently going to change your life. But then always at least a couple months, a couple months in, I would start kind of binging on the allowed foods on the diet. And I would like, I was like making these paleo pumpkin pies every day. And then by midnight I would eat the whole thing and I was beating myself up over it. And I was listening to all these paleo podcasts and reading all these paleo message boards And I remember following someone who had been paleo and who had said, you know what, Um, this is kind of messed up my hormones. It's kind of like taken away my cycle and I, we want to have a second child and I'm not able to. So I'm going to try and actually gain some weight and eat more carbs and see if that helps, you know, kind of kickstart my hormones again. I will never forget that because I was like, what? I've been trying to heal my hormones <laughs> for years, for 10 years by trying to not eat carbs. And you're telling me that I, you're trying to heal your hormones by eating more carbs. So that was definitely something that planted a seed in me. That was the first time that I was like, oh, is what I'm doing not healthy? Like, am I, am I wrong? Is the whole world wrong? So that was one piece. And then I remember... I was listening to a paleo podcast and whoever the paleo guru was, he said, well, you know, eating super low carb makes you more insulin resistant, but that's okay because, you know, you're not eating carbs anyway. And that was another time when I was like, wait, what? I have been trying to heal my insulin resistance, if that's even what it is, for 10 years by eating low carb. It was these little things that would like put this other perspective in my head where I was like, wait, maybe what I'm doing is not what I'm supposed to be doing. And then the binging got worse and worse and worse and worse. And it on my 24th birthday, which is like right after the holidays, I mean, that's when I'd been home making all of these paleo pumpkin pies and binging on them and eating like 97% chocolate in my bed at 1am, like starving, like, oh my God, what's wrong with me? And it was on my 24th birthday that I made all these paleo treats that no one wanted to eat. And I ate all of them. And I felt so sick to my stomach. And I had what I call an epiphany where I was like, oh my God, I have been doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over again for 10 years. And this is just one more time that I'm on a diet and it has made me completely nuts around food. And because of this, of those things that I'd heard from the disenchanted people, that that one disenchanted woman in the paleo community saying that going too low carb messed up her hormones, where I had been trying to heal my hormones for 10 years. 
And then on her blog, I was reading the comments, you know, of other people saying, oh my God, the same thing happened to me. So it was because of that, that I was able to say, you know what? I need to do the same thing. I need to stop this because I'm miserable, first of all. And I, I have seen firsthand, I have experienced firsthand that this has happened over and over and over again. I've tried, I, at this point, I have tried it all. I had been raw vegan. I had been, I'd done calorie counting. I tried my pseudo intuitive eating, which thank God I had done that already before because I was able to be like, okay, I know what I did wrong there. I was obsessed with weight. That was the problem because I thought that that was what was healthy. But so it was all of those things, all those experiences, and then those little things that I heard in the paleo community about hormones and about insulin resistance and about health, about how gaining weight could maybe even help me and be good for me. And that was so radical to me, but I was like, I think that's what I need to do. So that was the beginning. That was like the epiphany, the intuitive, like, okay, I need to do something different. And then I started researching and I, because I knew that what I needed to do, it was so clear to me that I needed to let myself gain weight. And I knew that I was petrified. Um, I started reading some books from fat activists. I wanted to like get a totally different perspective. And I, I don't really know how I found them. Like, I don't know if that was my idea, if I just like Googled it and found it, or if I read some blog that led to this and led to like, maybe it was some of the people who were trying to heal their own relationship with food and the comments of that woman's blog. I'm not quite sure, but I read, um, lessons from the fatosphere and I read, um, fat. So, and they were, they totally blew my mind. And then I think those were the books that led me to health at every size, the book. And after that, it was like, okay, this is what I needed to hear. And I'm going to do this. And that's when I started writing about it. And I was like doing a journaling exercise and I was like, why am I still so obsessed? And that's when I was like, I just need to be on the fuck it diet. Like that is what I need to be. And I need to say fuck it to all of these things. And I was like, Ooh, that would be a good like website name. And I was like, but it probably already exists. Like it's got to already be a thing. And I Googled it and it didn't except for that Margaret Cho joke, which I don't know if you've heard that no. it was like early 2000s. Mm. She has a joke yeah, where she was it. like, I, I'm on the fuck it diet. And I was like, hmm, this is just a joke. She's not like really writing about this and the website isn't taken. So I'm just going to buy it and start writing about this. And honestly, the rest, <laughs> the rest is history. Like I, I was very committed to it. I, my mind was absolutely blown by all the things I was learning, all the health at every size stuff that I had no idea about before. And I, I didn't really know that there was, because I had twisted intuitive eating so much when I first read the book, I thought that everybody did. So I was like, nobody understands what they really need to do. And I wasn't on Instagram or anything then. So I really believed that I was one of the only people who was, who would understand what I was doing. Obviously that's not true. There are lots of people out there, <laughs> you guys included, but I was like, no one will understand me. I need to do this on my own. So I was writing about it through the lens of like, can you believe this? Like, why doesn't anybody know this? And it felt like all of the things I was learning about weight and health and eating, you know, carbs and cravings, it was so, so, so counterculture to me. And it still is, obviously, we know that. But it was just so radical to me that I was like, I need to write about this. And if only five people read it, that's okay. I think way, way more than five. <laughs> More people read it. Yeah. Turns out there was a market. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And it was so cool because I had no, I mean, I'd always loved writing. I'd always had little blogs about this and that. Usually just silly, abs I like absurd writing, um, which is definitely a little infused into the fuck it diet. But I had never had anybody who really followed me before. So I had no reason to believe that I really would for this. But it's slowly, 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 I'd get emails from people saying, oh my God, I, I'm doing the same thing. It really is working. It's been so helpful to read. And I was like, wow, okay, I guess I'll keep going. And that is, that's that. <laughs> and eight years later, here we are. I feel very lucky, honestly, because I sort of fell into it. Um, but yeah, it was like four or five years ago that somebody who was good friends with a book agent 
had Googled why doesn't intuitive eating work? And, you know, disclaimer, intuitive eating does work, but so many people are twisting it into a diet that they feel that it, that it doesn't work. There's like, there's still something to rebel against when we're trying to use it as a way to eat less. And when she Googled that, she found my site and she read the whole thing and she was like, oh, wow, I want to send this to my agent friend. And that is how I got a book agent and, and got a book deal for the Faka diet. So it's been nuts, honestly. Like there are times when I'm like, wow, I feel like this has been like a train that had its own, like <laughs> the fuck it diet was its own, like it had its own uh, goals. And I just was like, all right, I'll just hitch on to this. Yeah. Um, Runaway train. But <laughs> off yeah, the track now. I, Let's just go. <laughs> yeah. It's totally, <laughs> it is. It is. But yeah. So that was, so it was, it really was, um, that was a long way to say, yes, it was kind of like one moment. It was that, that, that 24th birthday that I was like, okay, from all the things that I have experienced, it has led to the moment where I'm realizing that this is not working and it's never going to work. And I need to like radically go in the other direction. Yeah. It's amazing too. We just don't get the, the alternative, you know, it's very hard to find the, the non-diet health at every size message. Like it's, yeah. It, like you said, you had to, you don't even remember how you found some of the original sites. And, you know, and I also think that's a really common experience of like, oh, I'm the only one who knows about this. Mm-hmm. Like, I remember when I found a, a fat fashion blog and I was like, I'm the only person that's ever seen this. And yeah, like, it was so stupid. It like, feels that it way. Feels like, it feels that way. What? There are fat people dressing nicely and taking pictures of themselves and putting, and I'm like, oh, I must tell the world. I'm like, no stupid people see this. It's a blog. So anyway, um, I think it's it's pretty common to feel like you're the first, like you're the the archaeologist. Like I found yes. the, the lost, you know, texts of non diet or whatever. Like <laughs> I know, yeah. I know. And then finding the community, which honestly, I guess it was four years ago that I went on Instagram. But I still, I was still way better with social media. <laughs> I was like, no, I just go on social media to post. I don't scroll. I really had, it was an accident. I don't know. I guess my brain hadn't, I don't know. I don't know. My brain was still pure (laughs) back then. And I was like, no, no, I don't, you know, I just gotten, I had gotten off Facebook because I was like, oh, I'm starting to scroll too much. I'm just going to go on Instagram. And so I just posted. Um, and I didn't really follow anyone who had a similar message because I still didn't realize how many people there were out there. And it was only, I think, like three three years ago that I started following more anti-diet dietitians. And I was like, whoa, this is so great. <laughs> this is so great. Like, because for so long, people, you know, people would like write to me like these questions, and you know, like it people are very, very desperate when they're in a bad relationship with food. And I was so like stressed to be like, Oh no, like how do I respond with something that's going to help them? Now I'm like, I'm going to refer you to an anti-diet dietitian. (laughs) I'm just a writer. I think that you should get help from someone who can like truly help you. And I just feel so happy that there really is a community out there of people who are like-minded and who really can help people. Um, but for so long, I was like, wow, no one else understands. So for better or for worse, because I think it did kind of affect the way it, it le- the, in the very least it had my writing. Like I wasn't plagiarizing anybody. <laughs> I was like, this is the way that I've interpreted all of these things that I've, you know, that I've read. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that that was good that I wasn't like reading other people's memes and posts. So I wasn't able to like take the way that people explained it. You're figuring out um, in real time on your own. Right. Yeah. Really, truly. And being like, well, this is, you know, and so, and so there was a sense of urgency in the way that I was writing. Cause I was like, did you know this? Um, but now I'm just sort of like, well, there's lots of people so I can just hang back and <laughs> be less urgent with everything, you know? <laughs> you know, what you, you alluded to it a little earlier and, you talked about so much of the research you did. I'm wondering, you know, as people read this book or, or even people who um, 
might still be in diet culture that are sort of holding on to this belief that that you know their weight and health are directly connected and if their weight goes down their health will directly improve from it uh, on a, th- so many of the things that that spur us mm-hmm. um, i'm wondering if there's a couple like key pieces of research that you think were most helpful to you in writing this book that that our listeners really need to hear yes there are two big ones that kind of snapped me out of it myself and also just supported what I intuitively felt I needed to do. The first one was reading the health at every size book and Linda Bacon's, um, the study that she did with the two groups of women. One did the regular diet and exercise with the obesity, um, obesity. I know that's a not, we, we can bleep that if you we'll, want to we'll put it in quotes, um, air quotes. Okay. We're quoting, yes. we're air quoting. Quoting. How do I do, how do I do that? Okay. Quote unquote, obesity, you know, experts, quote unquote. And they did, you know, traditional diet exercise, watching calories. They had all the support in the world to, you know, help them try and lose weight and keep it off. And the other group learned intuitive eating, intuitive movement, working through weight stigma and shame and having a better relationship with their bodies, with their weight, with the food. There was no goal of losing weight. And over the course of two years, in the very beginning, the diet and weight loss group lost a lot of weight and their health markers improved, which I think is an important part because that is what can happen in the beginning. But over the course of two years, by the end, they had, for the most part, gained all of the weight back, some of them more weight back than they'd they'd started with. Their health got worse. The markers that they were testing for were like cholesterol, blood pressure, depression, anxiety. Um, A lot of people quit. A lot of people were still trying to stick to the diet and they still gained the weight back and they still had worse health markers at the end. And the group that was learning to have a better relationship with food and exercise and themselves and their weight They collectively did not lose any weight, but their health markers improved. When I read that, I was like, oh. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. So like that was such a clear way of explaining. Yes, when you go on a diet, you often lose weight and you often have improved health. But over time, our bodies fight back. Like that was just such a helpful way of showing that and explaining that. And on the flip side, if we take a different approach, we can improve our health without losing weight. And that to me, that honestly sums up so much to me. And reading that, that was, that was what I learned from the health at every size book that I just remember being like, wow. Okay. So this list like supports and corroborates the feeling that I have Mm -hmm. and the little things that I've been hearing you know, here and there that gaining weight might actually be good for some people's health, especially if they've been trying to suppress their weight for years on end. And then the other big study that kind of just puts, because what really helps me is to look at the big picture. My brain is so bad with retaining the information of studies. Like when we're talking about tiny little things here and there, Mm -hmm. I'm like, no, no, no. I, I can read it and be like, oh, great. And then my brain just sort of like, metabolizes it into like this base, very, very basic thing. Because what I need is like the bigger picture logic. I need to be able to like, look at what's happening big picture. And the other big thing was the Minnesota starvation experiment, Mm. which was this experiment that was done or the study that was done on conscientious objectors, men in the 1940s who didn't want to fight in World War II. But Ansel Keys wanted to study how to rehabilitate rehabilitate people who had been starving uh, in Europe during the war. And so he, some of the things that really stuck out to me was the um, the sort of like, you know, the, the part before the experiment, of course, I'm forgetting like all of the technical terms, but the part in the beginning before they actually started starving them, semi starving them. They were trying to live normally and feed these men normally, like how they usually eat in a, in a way that is healthy and sustainable. 
And they were put on a diet of approximately 3,200 calories, which was considered normal and healthy. And I remember, I remember being like, what? <laughs> Isn't that like so high? No, it's normal for moderately active men. Okay, that was the first thing. Then during the study to semi-starve them, he put them on half that much food, which was approximately 1600 calories. Now, somebody reached out to me after they read my book and they were like, I read that it was actually 800, 1800 calories, not 1600 calories. What do you say to that? And I was like, huh. <laughs> I say well, that's 200 calories. Yeah. I would, I would say that that actually proves the point even better. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that that's still not enough food. But I was like, well, okay, it, it, you know, ca also calorie counting is not an exact science. So it just, it literally doesn't matter. But between 1600 and 1800 calories they were put on for six months. And they were meant to, I think they had to keep up their walking. So it was like, I forget how many miles a week, but not that much. They would like walk a little bit every day. And they were all on a compound together so they could be, you know, monitored and make sure that they didn't, you know, go off this plan, basically. And they all became extremely skeletal because they weren't able to cheat on their diet like many people do. Extremely skeletal. They became anxious, depressed. They became obsessed with food. Some of them even became... Uh, chefs after this whole thing was over because they had this lingering obsession with food and they, they didn't become they... dietitians. Oh, that's surprising. <laughs> that's, that's the modern day version. Yeah. You, you know what? Been through diet culture, then you have to become a dietitian. Yes, yes exactly. Um, and they, they became, they like lost all their interest in politics. They were only interested in thinking about food, talking about food extending their meals. They became addicted to chewing, chewing gum and coffee. <laughs> and then some of them would like sneak off the campus because they were all on, um, I think, I think a college campus. I'm not sure. Um, but they were in like a dorm like situation and they would, there was one guy who would sneak off and like binge drink milkshakes. <laughs> and that always makes me laugh. So I was like, yeah, that's what they would do in the 1940s. Like, what else are you going to do? Like, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> what else? There's probably, I don't know if, I don't actually don't know if there was McDonald's then, but milkshakes sounds about right. They would go to like a soda shop and have milkshakes. And then when he got back to the camp, I think he like threatened, he like threatened the life of somebody. And so they put him in a mental institution or they, they put it, they took him to a psych ward. And after a couple of days of being fed regularly, his mental health went back to normal. And I was like, okay, yeah. all right. This is explaining so much. Yeah. <laughs> this is really explaining so much. And then, so I think the interesting th thing there is to see, okay, 1600 calories. Yes, it's men. And yes, a lot of people who read my work and follow me are women, but it's still not enough food. It's still really not enough food. And the fact that, you know, unable to cheat, except for the one guy who snuck off to drink milkshakes, it made them so, so, so skeletal. I mean, you can look up, you can search Minnesota starvation experiment, look up pictures. They were truly skeletal. And they were on a diet of, I think it was like a vegetarian diet. They had like vegetables, beans, bread, milk. Um, I think they had like two meals a day. And they would like, like take the meal and take it back to their rooms, like eat it really slowly and like put water in it to extend it and savor it. And they thought it tasted amazing, even though it was like super bland, which is like what we do. We become obsessed with food. We think that our diet food is like, oh, I really love this. Right. I really love chickpea cookies. It's why people like Halo Top ice cream. Exactly. Exactly. It's like you just need to have a bit more food to realize that is not that good. Is <laughs> Exactly. But when you don't have enough food, you're like, wow, it's cold. I love it. <laughs> but, um, so all of these things, I mean, I was looking at all of these different things that the men were experiencing and I was like, okay, that is what I experienced over and over again on diets. And no, I didn't really become skeletal, which is why I never thought that I personally had an eating disorder. I thought that my problem was binge eating and overeating, not understanding the connection, but I was cheating all the time on the diets because I couldn't stay on the super, super. I, I remember I had these journals in high school where my goal, my goal was a, I thought a healthy, moderate 
1800 calories. That is what I thought was like normal. And I would have like one day of sticking to it. I wrote down everything I ate and I would even like overestimate like the calories and the food that I was eating just so I wasn't really going over. And I couldn't stick to that for more than one day. I would like go above it. And I was so upset with myself. I was like, what is wrong with me? I have like a gluttony problem. Of, you know, that's my like sort of <laughs> Catholic confusion. I was like, <laughs> not only, not only am I irresponsible, but I am sinful. That was me in high school, but I couldn't stick to it. I could not stick to the calorie level that I wanted to. I could for like a day or two. And then I would, and then I just, I couldn't, I really, I was so hungry. And I, I thought that that was the problem. I was like, why am I so hungry? But seeing that these men, when they actually were forced to stick to the amount of calories, how quickly they became skeletal. And it really like it affected their health really poorly. They were freezing cold all the time. And they even developed, um, I think this is so fascinating and I still don't really understand it, but they all, they did not enter this wanting to lose weight. That was not their goal. They wanted to help understand how to refeed starving people. And they had, and they like weeded out people to, to only have people who were extremely committed to the goals of the experiment. So they had people who were like, yes, I want to do this. I want to help. I want to, you know, I'm going to comply. They, first of all, so the men, when they started cheating, that was like a, clear indication of how hard it was to stick to it because they had every intention of sticking to the rules of the experiment. But they also started thinking that they were not thin, even though they were. So that, and so they had this body dysmorphia, even though their personal goals were, was it, they did not want to lose weight, but the fact that being that thin made them like have a distorted view of their body I don't get that. Like, I, I can't put any logic to that. Like, I don't understand the, the biological reason that that would happen to us. But I always assumed that body dysmorphia was the thing that led to restrictive eating or anorexia. But in this instance, it was the other way around. So that is really fascinating to me that it almost feeds itself. Yeah, that happened to me too. Like, I didn't really hate my body that much when I first started dieting. And then when I lost weight... And I kept my weight off for like 16 years, but then it got crazier and crazier as time went by. And mm-hmm. like, I, I feel like I learned how to hate my body during that time, but they weren't immersed in diet culture the way I was. So it is kind of interesting. Right. Yeah. Oh, well, I always would assume that it was diet culture, that it was like, yeah. okay, this is human. This is how humans are. You know, we, it's never good enough. The goalpost is always moving. Yeah. You know, there's always something else to micromanage and we make this our worldview. So of course we're going to get more and more and more critical. So that's always what I assumed. And it makes sense. I think that's also happening too. But the fact that uh, like just being semi-starved because they were eating food and they were eating an amount of food that is currently considered like a healthy diet amount, which is in quotes, you can't see me everyone, but I'm doing air quotes. And because it's not, it's not enough food. But I just, that it truly blows my mind. And then the actual refeeding. So the, the nuts thing about this is that the experiment, the experiment was not even supposed to be about the starving. Like I think right. they were shocked to learn what they learned about eating that little and what it actually does to your psychology and your mental health and your physical health. What they were really trying to do was see how to rehabilitate people. And they assumed in the beginning that the best way to refeed people was a small incremental, like just up the calories by like 400 calories and then up it more and more and more as time went on to acclimate them to eating more food. But the people, and so they were put in different groups. There was one group who was just given 400 more calories, one group that was given, I think 800, and then one that was given 1600. So one group was eating as much as they were eating before the starvation experiment. And the other two weren't eating as much as they were before. And the all of them really didn't improve that much and didn't improve that quickly. But the only group that had any improvement at all were the ones who were eating as much as they were eating before. And then they found that the only way to really recover and to really get back to the way they were before to help their mental health, to help their physical health, was to eat way more than what they eat it. What's up? I was, I was distracted by my dog. 
sorry, my dog is dreaming and and wagging her little tail. <laughs> she's dreaming about oh eating. <laughs> I, she's dreaming about snow oh, yeah. <laughs> and eating. <laughs> sorry, let me get back to this. Um, the only way that they actually made any progress in recovery, in recovering their physical and mental health, was eating way more than what they were ever eating before. And so they started letting the men eat as much food as they were hungry for. And they were absolutely starving for like 5,000 calories, like often, often it was that much food in a day and sometimes way, 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 way more than that. So it was, it was this like illogical thing. Oh my God, she's running. Are you running on your side? Who are you playing with in your (laughs) dreams, Molly? (laughs) Aw. Oh, I woke her up. Sorry. Um, But basically, like, there were some days when these men were eating 1,100 calories, which, or not, not, sorry, not 1,100, 11,000 calories. And that's how much they were hungry for. And there was this sensation of hunger that they couldn't even, it was like this weird thing where they felt really physically full, but they still were hungry. And that also jumped out to me because that is what I experienced when I was trying to refeed myself. And that is something that I hear from from a lot of people say like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm trying to eat a lot of food, but I'm often like really full and really hungry at the same time. And just reading that this is something that happens after you've essentially been dieting and start to try and refeed yourself. Just the more that you can know that your experience is normal and you're not broken and you're not the one, you know, unsavable food addict in this world. I think those are really important things to, to know. Yeah. I think too, like until your body restores to its to a, a weight of safety, um, that you're gonna keep being really hungry. Yeah. For a long time. Yeah, and that scares people so much because everything we hear and learn is that it is extremely dangerous to be hungry and it's extremely dangerous to give unto your cravings. Yeah. So people have all of this internalized fear to let their bodies do what it needs to do. And that, I mean, that's why most people don't recover without the support. Yeah. And I'm curious. So after, so for you, after you sort of started to level off feeling like, oh, I'm not so ravenously hungry. Did you, did you experience the other thing that a lot of my clients experience, which is like, oh, I've been eating and eating and eating and it's been great. And all of a sudden one day they're like, oh my God, I am so uninterested in food. I don't even know what to do. Like I call it food yes. fatigue. Did you hit yes. that? I did. I'm trying to think how far in I hit that. I probably hit it like, you know, six months to a year in. It's really hard for me to remember the exact. I know that's like a big chunk of time, but it it took me at least six months to feel like a shift in my relationship with food, like a like a dramatic physical shift like you're talking about. And I remember being like, wow, I genuinely thought that people who like didn't think about food and didn't remember to eat or who were like, I really, I don't even, I don't like any of this food. I thought they were lying. (laughs) I thought they were, I, I was like, you didn't forget to eat lunch, you liar. There's no way you could forget to eat lunch. Because all I did was think about food. All I did was think about my next meal, my next snack. Think about, oh my God, I'm so hungry, but I'm just gonna wait two more hours to eat. All I did was think about food. So when it switched and when I started being like, oh my God, I don't want to eat, but I know that I need to. And I know that I should, because I will be hungry later. I will be starving later. I, you know, it was, it was annoying. Like it's not fun. It's not fun to not know what you want to eat, but it was such a marked difference from my previous relationship to food that it was a sign to me that this was working because I had been, I really genuinely thought that my problem was an addiction to food. And I thought that that's why I needed to diet. Some people aren't addicted to food. I thought I am. And so I can't be trusted and I must monitor what I eat and I have to micromanage it. And so when it did switch and I started to not think about it as much or be like, Oh God, lunchtime. I was like, wow, this is, a huge difference, a really huge difference from, from how it was before. Um, but I hear this all the time. I hear it 
just as much as you guys, I'm guessing people are like, is this normal? Like I've been doing it for four or five, six months and I ate all the food and I took away all the rules and I ate everything I wanted. And now I'm just like bored with food. Like, is this, is something wrong or is this to be expected? And I've heard it enough times that it's to be expected. And I, I think if we can just remember that it's like, it, it's, I kind of think it's almost like a, the pendulum swing in the other direction again. So like when we're refeeding the pendulum swings and you're starving, you need to give into that. You need to eat a lot of food. You need to let yourself eat all of the things that you crave. And then it's almost like, okay, thank you. Now, <laughs> now you're fooded out. <laughs> Now food is like not as exciting as it was. And I do think that, you know, I hesitate to talk about that with people or to like, to tell people that that's what's going to happen. Because if you're in a diet mindset, you kind of twist that information into worrying that that means that you're not going to be able to eat what you want after you go through the process. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like I've heard people be like, uh, I've heard people hear me talk about that and be like, what do you mean? I'm supposed to get to a place where I don't, where I don't even like care about food. Like that sounds like a scary diet thing. When people are so obsessed with food, it's almost like, it's almost like giving up the the highs and lows of, of the diet. And we're almost addicted to that roller coaster in a way, like the high of finding a new diet and then the high of like the cheat day or, or the binge, even though you feel all the shame, there's like this extreme excitement in a way. Yeah. And to give that up, I think that's scary to some people, but what I try and remind them is you're still allowed to eat whatever you want, all your favorite foods. I encourage you even to, you know, be more sensitive to your cravings and the foods that you really do want to eat when you go through that period. But, um, It's definitely something that I've heard from people over and over and over and over again. And it's definitely something that I experienced and I still sometimes experience it. Yeah. And I think too, there might be a loss that goes along with that where it's like, oh, I used to feel so excited about this food and it was so thrilling to be able to plan to get it and to, and then all of a sudden it's not this super special food anymore. And so there's, there's a loss, I think, and like some mourning that has to happen where, well, I remember think I've said this on other podcasts too, where like, I just thought I was such a foodie for so long because I was so hungry. Yes. But it turns out like I yes. was just hungry. I was just really yes, hungry. Exactly. Like I, like my favorite cheeseburger is still a McDonald's quarter pound of cheese. Like, like sorry, man. Right. That's like, I am so pedestrian with my food choices sometimes. <laughs> and it's just because like, I'm not starving. And I think right. there's this, then the the work after that, which is like, to figure out how do you come to a meal hungry enough to enjoy it, but not starving. And then that's yes. hard work to do too. Yes. And that's what I feel like I have started to do. And it's so interesting if someone doesn't have a healed relationship with food and they know that I write about food and they know that I write about, you know, not dieting and that my book is called the fuck a diet. If they see me you know, turn down a cookie or turn down something that someone's offering me because I'm not hungry. They're so confused. They're like, I thought you didn't diet. I'm like, no, I just, I wouldn't enjoy it. Right. (laughs) I wouldn't enjoy it the way I will in an hour or two. Right. You know, I'm not hungry. And it took, I think, I think, you know, that's the same way with me. Like I thought people were lying. I thought people were lying when they said they weren't hungry or didn't want something that I was like, how can you say no? How can you say no when like, when it's snack time, how can you not eat at snack time? You know, but it's just when you're just like you said, when you're in that, when you're hungry for years and years and years, you're obsessed with food and you think you're a foodie. And I thought that I wanted to be a food writer. I thought I, you know, it was like, I was like, I love artisanal foods and like farm to table foods. And I wanted to like, I thought that was my way of like, you know, loving food, but also being snobby about food. You know, I thought I wanted to be a dietitian. (laughs) And then I became one. (laughs) And then I stopped dieting and I was like, shit, what am I doing in this on my way to becoming this profession that I know? Like, 
I, because I wanted to become a dietitian because I thought it would help me diet all the time because diet right. is literally in the word dietitian. Right. <laughs> so did you stop dieting in the middle of your schooling yeah. and training or did? Okay. Yeah. So my, wow. my first nutrition teacher was Lindo Bacon. Oh my God. And then like that blew my mind apart. And then I stopped dieting and counting almonds and from that point but then I was like I had a total existential crisis like I don't know how I can be a dietitian and do this and that's when I started to find like non-diet dietitians out there and like right. you know like you said like all these fat activists and it's just like it's a rabbit hole you have to find the first like way into and then it's like we here you go and luckily I yes. found all those people that could like um I could model myself after I think Aaron, isn't and that you why you became a dietitian too? Like, oh, totally. Yeah, no, I had my yeah. own shit with food going on, and I was gonna be the next Richard Simmons. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> right, I know. And you know, a lot of people will ask me, "So, are you going to become a dietitian? Like, you're not a dietitian, but you talk about this stuff. So, like, are you ever gonna like officially become one?" Mm. And I'm like, "Hell no, <laughs> I." Never want to talk about food again. <laughs> yeah, right. Like you're like the the whole thing of not having to be in diet culture anymore is to not have to worry about food all the time. Exactly. I mean, I'm so like, you know, I almost, you know, I, I've had this like guilt. I've been like, oh, I guess I should, I guess I should become a dietitian. But I'm like, I can't, like, I can't. I can't force myself to think about food for one more minute than I have to. Well, so, you know, if you don't like working in hospitals, it's really not the thing to right. become either. Right. <laughs> so, like, you be, I feel like being a dietitian is so much less about food and so much more about, like, seeing sick people in the I hospital. I know. I know. And, the, the, you know, for better or for worse, I'm in a nice position to be like, why would I do that to myself if I could just... Right. <laughs> you know, but yeah, no, I really, I really genuinely, I'm actually surprised that I never considered becoming a dietitian. I really am. I just sort of thought that I, you know, I became an quote unquote expert of diet rules. You know, I, I had my own little expertise, I thought. Yeah. You might not have been looking for a new career at the time because I was definitely, I wasn't, I was definitely like, right. I need a new career. I cannot be like, I was basically a secretary. And I was right, like, right. I, I have such authority issues. This is not the right job for me. <laughs> so like I knew right. I had to get out of it. So I was like, this will be my new career. That actually was exactly it. I was still like, I'm going to be an actress and I'm going to finally be skinny and it's all going to work out. Yeah. So I, I was, you know, and then I thought that I was going to just write about this. And then ironically, I actually became a secretary when I, <laughs> the very first year of my fuck it diet. I knew that I had to quit acting because at least for a time and I did for a time and then I went back into it and I've quit again. But I knew that I couldn't change my relationship with weight and let myself gain weight and let my body do what it needed to do if I was still going into auditions for Mary Poppins and Cinderella and stuff. I was like, there's no way. I know that this is a huge piece of my obsession with food and weight. I have to stop. And I was sad about it, but I was miserable enough that I knew that it just had to be this way. And it was like, I'm either going to be miserable for the rest of my life and trying to make this thing work that I now know doesn't work and will never work. Or I need to, you know, I need to get a new job. And so I became a secretary (laughs) for a year. And I was like, I hate this so much. Yeah. My God. Like, I just think it's not a bad job. It's just like, I'm really bad at it. (laughs) Yes. I I was so bad. I was like, (laughs) I cannot believe that you guys let me proofread your press releases. (laughs) I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. (laughs) I'm so bad with commas. Yeah. I'm sorry. I can't believe I was just entrusted to organize stuff because I have really <laughs> zero ability to organize myself at home. So I don't know, like, where did all those skills go that I had? But I don't know. So. You're rebelling against them still. Yeah, still. So I said, fuck it to those skills. So, yeah. yeah. You got it. Yeah. 2020 has just got to be one of the most oddball, hard challenging years in in so many ways and and recently on on a couple of your podcasts you've really um started to talk a lot about racial injustices that we see in our country right now and and about about thin privilege yes. and about white supremacy and and I'm wondering you know a lot of folks are having some challenges about connecting that to diet culture and why are we 
connecting these things in, in this way. And I'm wondering mm. if you could just speak to that a little bit because I, I love what you said on your show and, and just give us a little bit of um, your own perspective on this right now. Yes. For me, I did not see or understand the connection until recently. Honestly, I would hear people say it and be like, okay, I believe you. I just don't understand. Like, I don't, I wouldn't know how to explain it because I don't mm-hmm. understand yet. And I was, I remember hearing people say, you know, white uh, diet culture is definitely a manifestation of white supremacy. And I would think, okay, I don't, get it yet. I don't understand. I believe you, but I don't get it. And I understood that, it, like, okay, policing bodies, we need body autonomy. It's all about like beauty standards. And so I see the overlap and, but I did not understand the history of trying to change our bodies to be more frail and pure and acceptable. And so it really was Sabrina Strings book, Fearing the Black Body, that put it into a way clearer context for me to really see where it comes from, how it truly does come from a place where, you know, white people and white women were trying to separate themselves from people of color and black people. And that there was this belief about fatness and blackness and, um, you know, sinfulness and inability to curtail you know, eating and sex and all of this stuff that I just, I mean, nobody talks about that anymore, but it has kind of just distilled into, it's still in the background of our culture, even if we don't know where it comes from. So the way that I see it now is that there still are these beauty ideals, even facial beauty ideals. You know, why was I so obsessed with hating my nose? Why was I so ex- obsessed with all of these tiny little ways that I would nin- nitpick my own body and my own face? It's based on these ideals that are Eurocentric beauty standards, thinness, purity. And it was when I started seeing it from that perspective that that still affects us so, so, so deeply. It, it affected me. I mean, I hate, I really hate to say that I didn't understand it until I could see how it affected me. And then I was like, oh, I see. I see how if it's affected me, how is it affecting other people who don't fit in as easily to this, this beauty ideal that we see all of the time in magazines and on television and in movies. So it really took me seeing it from that perspective to understand that white supremacy is still alive and well and infused into diet culture and diet culture is infused into white supremacy. Yeah. Yeah. And it's such an important like place for our, for this conversation to go in, in this current time, I think because, you know, we're really trying to dismantle so many different forms of oppression and sort of pay attention to them. Um, I think the more discussions around this are, are really important and, and also just, you know, um, helping, you know, I think being vulnerable enough to say, listen, I, I, I didn't understand it at one point. And, you know, through this way of, I, I'm calling it unlearning right now, um, of, to this unlearning, like I've helped see something differently. I think that's just like, so I think that's very human right now. And I think something that is missing in, in a lot of the conversations, how do we, um, continue, this discussion to help more and more people in this unlearning. Right. Right. And I, you know, I, I don't, I want to be able to speak to it and, and explain it the way that I now Mm -hmm. understand it. If it's helpful to people, I'm trying to be careful not to be like, now I like teach, you know, I teach this. Now I teach white supremacy or like how to, you know, that's, that's not my place place either, but understanding the connection, being able to speak to the connection um, I think is, is absolutely is very, very important. I'm curious if, if anybody, so you said that mostly women kind of follow you and that's like mostly see women and that's mostly who talk about your, your book, but I'm curious if you have any like male readers reach out to say that they were affected by this. I do. I do. And I'm always like, wow, <laughs> men resonate with my message. 
Um, but I, I do, I would say it's like 5%, honestly. And I think that's partially just because, uh, you know, culturally men don't realize that they're allowed to struggle with body image issues. Like, I feel like there's an Aaron, I'm sure you can speak to this and understand this, but I feel like we're like socially, you know, this is the, this is a manifestation of the patriarchy. It's like men feel like they have to have it all together and can't struggle with these things. And I, Mm -hmm. I know that men struggle more and more. I mean, I even look at like my family and my brother, my dad, like they're obsessed with exercise. And why do you think, you know, so I know it's there. I just, I, I hope the conversation becomes more and more comfortable for men as we go forward. Yeah. I, I mean, reading your book, I didn't, nothing jumped out to me where it was very, it doesn't feel female centric to me, I guess. Good. I'm glad. Um, Although maybe it's hard for me to see other, like, maybe it's just like, this right. is written for me. And I feel like, <laughs> right. but I do think that, I do think the message is really universal to just eat. I hope. Right. Yeah. Eat a I lot. So. <laughs> when I, when I, you know, when I got the, um, you know, when I started working with the editor after I got a book deal for the Fuck It Diet, she was not the right editor for me. And it was a big trauma. And it was very stressful. And I cried a lot. And I thought I had to get out of the book deal because mm. I was like, wow, this woman does not understand any of this. But thankfully, they gave me a new editor. She was wonderful. I loved her so much. It was it turned into a great experience after a really traumatic experience. But in the beginning, she kept saying, okay, this book needs to be more feminist. It needs to be more feminist. It needs to be more, you know, you can't, you can't speak to everyone. You have to like niche it down. And I was like, okay, I, I understand you. I understand you. <laughs> and then of, of course I worried. I was like, she's right. She's right. Oh no. My book is, cause I had written, you know, unusually I had written most of it. Um, I'd written all of it. And then I just changed tiny little things here and there when I was working with the editor that I ended up working with. But I remember having this like pit in my stomach where I was like, but it's not just for women. Like, yeah, most of my readers are women. Yeah. I talk about things that are, you know, specific to a female experience, but the, the bigger message of, we all think we need to be dieting. We all think we need to be micromanaging our weight to be loved and accepted. And we're all nuts about food because of this dieting. It's, it is for everyone. And I fought back a little bit and there are still lines in there where I'm like, oh, I put that line in there when I was trying to make this book more quote unquote, more feminist, just to make her happy before I got a new editor. But I think it's inherently feminist, like the message. Um, but I also think that it's supposed to be for everyone. I really do. I really, really do. And I hope that it, and I'm happy to hear that you think that it, that it is. Yeah. I, I mean, and I don't think there's anything wrong with men reading Feminist or being feminist. Yeah. Like, Agreed. Agreed. Why, or if being you're a man, why, what's that? Yeah. yeah. Why aren't you a feminist? <laughs> what? You're not against violence towards women? Okay. Right. Interesting. That's the truth. <laughs> that is the truth. Right. That's very, very true. Though I wanted, I wanted the reader to be able to be any, like I wanted the person that I was speaking to, to be able to be anyone with the disclaimer that, hey guys, I know most of you are probably women, <laughs> but this is for everyone. Yeah. I mean, I think it, I think more men should pick it up because I think it could be incredibly helpful. Um, and I you're hope. writing a new book. Can you talk about it yet? <gasps> Are you allowed to? I can. Okay. I can. I am allowed. I'm allowed to talk about it. It's official. Um, I, I'm not going to say what the tentative title is because I'm having an existential crisis over the tentative <laughs> <laughs> over it. But the book is supposed to be about my rabid search for a miracle cure. And that manifested with extreme diets and, you know, twisted intuitive eating into what I thought was intuitive eating, but was actually just more diets and self-help books. And it was always this like extremist mentality that I'd finally found the cure. And I did that for so, so long. And it's, it's the way my brain you know, was wired to work until I deliberately unlearned that. But I want the book to be about my experience with extremism and dogma with diets and self-help books. But I also want it to be sort of about our cultural extremism with 
diets and self-help and, and wellness. Yeah, I think that's going to be so important because I think it's, I think people really resonate with individual stories. Totally. I hope so. You should that's just call I, it, this book will make you thin. Subtitle, <laughs> just kidding. You know, I just want people to buy it. So, you know, like. <laughs> I know, I know. It needs, I know. I want it to be called like, this is not advice. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to give any more advice. No, I'm, I'm, I've been waiting for two months for my agent to read my full first draft and give me feedback, but she's been so swamped with other manuscripts ahead of mine that I've just been slowly going insane. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just slowly going insane. First two months of quarantine, I was like, great, I can work on this book every day. And I did. And the last two months of quarantine, I've been like, I will never be happy again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's where I think that's where we're all at. I will never be happy again. <laughs> uh, but um, I'm very excited about the second book. I wish that I was feeling I'm, I'm in a place where I'm like, wow, maybe it's horrible. Maybe she's going to give me feedback and I'm going to have to start from scratch. So unfortunately, I'm not going to be good at at selling you listener on on the book right now, because right now I'm like, wow, can't believe I think I'm a writer. <laughs> but Hopefully, I keep telling myself in a couple months I might feel better. <laughs> yeah, you're a writer. So, you should probably know this. You're a writer because you wrote a book. I yeah, I guess. <laughs> and it's been published. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome uh, to your new career. <laughs> I know. Well, that's what I'm saying. I'm like, oh God, this is my life, isn't it? Yeah. Writing something and waiting for feedback and going insane and like, you know. You know, yep. that's just the way it is. I do know that. And I will say, do you guys know the book, The Artist's Way? Yes. I've heard of it. It's about uh, creativity. Yeah, I it. never yeah. read it. I never read it because I don't consider myself an artist. But yeah, it's I know so about good. it. And I even recommend it to people who don't consider themselves artists. But it just kind of explains the creative process in a way that is just so helpful. Like I, if I can just remind myself that this is normal, people who are creative think that they are horrible at what they do in the middle of the process and it's it just expect it. Then I'm like, okay, great. This is normal. You know? Yeah. So that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. I think the creative people have said to me like, Oh, are you going to write a book now? Cause I guess that's what you do once you become a dietitian. That's what my dad thinks anyway. And, uh, I was like, no, that's hard work. I wrote a blog for like two or three years. That's my book. It's free. You're welcome. <laughs> I know. Yeah. No, it's way too hard at work. <sighs> in my it's opinion. All, it's it's hard. It is hard. It definitely is hard. Though I will say the fuck it diet sort of wrote itself. I mean, that was so much easier than what I'm doing right now. I don't know. It really, I, I, I've said this many times, but I do feel like the fuck it diet sort of has a mind of its own. And I sometimes like, you know, I, I am lucky to be able to like be the one writing it down, but I feel like it's beyond me in some ways. So that made it easy that I was like, I know what this is. This has already like revealed itself to me. This book now could just be anything like which, which weird story do I tell about dieting? Yeah. (laughs) All of them. (laughs) (laughs) I'm trying. Yeah. Well, we are so grateful that you came and talked to us today on our podcast. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. This has been so fun. Thank you. Yeah, you're fun to talk to. And uh, (laughs) I love your podcast. And I can't wait to see your your next book. Um, Uh, Yeah. I hope it's worth it. It's going to be great. (laughs) Yeah. Yes. Watch me when I'm finished be like, guys, it's awful. Just don't buy it. I don't think that's, you might need some marketing that, yeah, with that yeah. one. That might help. Don't tell people it's awful. Oh my God. Yeah, I need to hire Just say that like, internally. No, don't say that. Don't say that, please. Yeah. Well, thank you again so much. Thank you. Thank you.